Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, good to have everybody back with us, and uh, you folks out in television don't enjoy these coffee breaks like we do. <clears throat> we, we just have a good time. And uh, we've got folks visiting us from uh, Joliet, Chicago, Illinois area, and uh, I've got my son and his wife. We'll get their picture again next program. We're going to skip this time. But anyway, for those of you out in television, we're just thrilled to have you with us and that we can come into your living room or den, wherever it is, and uh, just open the scriptures. And uh, we trust the Holy Spirit can lead and direct you to understand what we read. Because after all, it really isn't that difficult. It's uh, usually pretty self-explanatory. All right, now we're going to jump from 62, which reminds me, Iris just reminded me a moment ago, we are finishing up today book number 62. And for those of you out in television, if you write concerning the program in whatever format, just uh, tell us that you're looking at book number 62, which is a compilation, remember, of 12 continuous programs. Okay? Isaiah 63, verse 1, and the reason I'm jumping over those final verses 62, they're just a continuation of the glories that is awaiting Israel, and uh, when the kingdom comes in and they have the king, but I want to be able to start chapter 63 with a separate program because now we're going to jump from the kingdom back to the horrors of the wrath and vexation that's going to precede it and uh, which all the world, of course, is being primed for today. You know, I ha can't help but think of when I see these movies advertised. I don't attend them, but we can see them advertised, of all the disasters and the calamities of one sort or another. And you know what I think? I think that's just God's way of preparing the world's population for what's coming. Because, you see, it's not going to be just physical suffering. There's going to be so much mental suffering. It's going to be beyond our human comprehension. So anyway, we're dropping in now into that period of time. I haven't got my timeline behind me now. But that period of time just before the return of Christ, or what we call the tribulation. All right? Isaiah 63, verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. And I'm going to read verse 2, and then we'll come back and comment. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him who treadeth the wine vat? Now, this is symbolic language, of course, but what's the picture? Now, one commentary I read, believe it or not, said that this was just a picture of Christ in his first advent. Unbelievable how they can miss it so far. This is Christ that is coming in wrath and vexation and judgment in the closing days of the tribulation. Now, of course, most of you are acquainted with Armageddon, that last great battle. And, of course, I'm sure that that's involved here. But what we've really got is a symbolic picture now of Christ as he's ready to return and finalize the wrath and vexation. Now, the reason I use those two terms, I use it quite extensively. Come back with me again to a place that we've looked at over and over so you'll see where I get my language. Come back to Psalms chapter 2, verse 5. Psalms chapter 2, verse 5. And I want you to get just as acquainted with these verses and the terminology as I am. Be able to show people, hey, this is what's coming. Today, we're not in the wrath and vexation. We're in the grace of God. God is permitting these things, but His grace is still abundant. But grace will be withdrawn. And it's only going to be the wrath and vexation. All right, Psalms chapter 2, verse 5. Then, in other words, at that point in time, He, God, will speak unto them. Who? The population of the world. He will speak unto them in His what? Wrath. Not mercy, not love, not grace. That has ended. 
And now he's speaking in wrath and will do what? Vex them. That's why I get the term vexation. In his wrath and vexation, he's going to pour out torment and death and destruction and misery like the world has never known. And again, like I said in the last program, is God being unfair? No. He's given the human race 2,000 years of grace. All of these people that will be involved in these final years of judgment will have lived during all this time of preaching and proclaiming the gospel of the grace of God. And why are they there for judgment? Because they rejected it. It's that simple. And so don't blame God. He's been warning ever since the dawn of human history that this point of time is coming. But you take the rank and file person even right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the buckle on the Bible belt. You show them and tell them these things and they look at you as though you're out of your cage. There's something wrong with you. This is never going to happen. God won't ever permit this. Oh, and the day comes of his wrath and vexation. He won't just permit it. He's going to direct it. Today, he permits. He's not directing anything that's awful, but he's permitting it. But in this day and time, it's going to be the outpouring of his wrath and his vexation. All right, back to Isaiah 63. So I just want you to see where I pick up the language. Verse 2, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine vat? Now, as you take verse 1 and verse 2, then, in its symbolic context, what you have is an indication of Christ, like some great Roman-clad uh, soldier, with all of his armor and his apparel and the, the sword, which is the Word of God, and he's coming seemingly from the south part, which was Edom, down there south of the Dead Sea. And he's just like, you know, I, I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm going to because I think my audience understands where I come from. As I was studying this over the last several days now, I couldn't help but constantly, and it came again now, so evidently I'm supposed to use it. Those of you who are acquainted with northern Minnesota all know the legend of whom? Paul Bunyan. What's the legend of Paul Bunyan? This humongous woodsman who stepped from place to place across Minnesota, and every place he stepped was left a what? A lake. That's the legend of Paul Bunyan. You go up through Babidji and you'll see a likeness of him. Well, you know, as I look at this, I couldn't help but think, well, this is a supernatural Paul Bunyan. And as he makes each step in his stride, it is not peace and tranquility, it's what? Death and destruction. His wrath. He's not coming like the lowly lamb. He's coming in the power of his wrath and vexation like a great humongous Roman clad soldier just spreading death and destruction. Consequently, in verse 2, what has happened to his apparel? It's splashed with blood. Now, we don't like to think in terms of that with God. But this isn't the God that we're dealing with today. I've got to keep repeating that. God today is the God of love, mercy, and grace. Absolutely. But when this day comes, it's going to be the God of wrath and judgment. And all the Old Testament has been foretelling it. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, warned Israel of it. Paul speaks of it just in one place. And I've always emphasized, Paul doesn't write much prophecy, but he does for just a few verses in 2 Thessalonians 2. But it's coming, beloved. Now, as believers, we're not going to be here. But the scorning, unbelieving world is going to finally come under that wrath and vexation of God. All right, at his second coming. And so he comes looking like someone who has been stomping the grapes in the wine vat. Now, you can imagine what that person would look like, just all splattered with grape juice, and whatever color his clothes, it would just be matted with that residue of the grapes. But this isn't grape juice, beloved. It's blood of mankind, see? All right, now then, verse 3. I have trodden the winepress alone. In other words, he's not going to have multitudes of people helping him. 
This wrath is going to be poured out from God and God alone. All right? And I will tread them in my love and mercy and grace. No, in his what? In his anger. Verse 3. All right, reading on. I will trample them in my fury. Now, this isn't pretty language. I know it isn't. But it, on the other hand, it tells us what the world is getting ready for. Their whole mentality of absolute absence of morality. And we see it on every hand. There is no integrity. There is no anything with reference to God's Word. They are in total rebellion. Now, I'll say it again. I thank the Lord myself the other morning. When you look at the world in general, spiritually and morally speaking, we Americans are still head and shoulders above the rest of the world. As bad as we are, we are still head and shoulders above the Orient or above the Middle East or above Europe. Now, that'll give you a little indication of what it's like. Now, you see... You take Thailand, right in the middle of all this disaster. You know what Thailand is really most known for, especially across Europe? It's the prostitution capital of the world. And we think it's bad here. No, it's not even close. And so when we speak of these things, don't think that God is being unfair. He's been warning the world for centuries of this wrath that's coming. And it's going to be like someone who is treading in the wine vat. And then reading on, finish the verse 3. And I will be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain my raiment. Now this is the coming Christ alone who is pouring out wrath and judgment. Now just to show you how all of Scripture fits, come back with me now to Revelation. Revelation chapter 14. Now here John is writing after Christ's first advent, and it's in perfect accord with what Isaiah wrote 700 years before. Revelation chapter 14, and we're going to take our time. We haven't taught this on the program since our Revelation series, have we? Way, way, way back. You know, I wish we'd have never put our copyright year on our programs because then people wouldn't have been so aware when we made these. But see, when that copyright is on there, 1996, they'll call and say, Les, are you still making programs? The program this morning you made way back in 96. Well, I wouldn't teach it one bit different today than I did then. So if we'd have just left that off, they wouldn't have known the difference, see? But anyway, Revelation 14. Now look at this. Verse 14. Now again, it's symbolism. But it's coming back to the same literal fact that we've got in Isaiah 63. I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto who? The Son of Man. The word Son is capitalized. It's Christ. And having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now in whatever culture you may live or have lived in the past, what did they use the sickle for? To harvest, see? Now, believe it or not, we were in Amman, Jordan, not too many years ago, and looked out the bus window, and there they were like a, like a bunch of ants out in a wheat field, and they were all harvesting that wheat with that little handheld sign. That's just a few years ago. But see, it always was indicative of harvesting. Now, here, they're not going to use the side to cut wheat. They're going to use it to cut the grapes off the vine. Okay? This is the symbolism now. And so the Son of Man, Christ himself, is pictured like someone harvesting grapes. Verse 15, Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, or harvest, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. What does it mean by that? ripe for judgment. God has now put up with their rejection for 6,000 years, culminating in the ungodliness of our present day. Now again, 
I always have to explain some of these things. Why does God pour out such horrible judgment on one generation of people? How can he ignore all those that go clear back to Adam? Well, I've always stressed it with one word. Numbers. Numbers. See, there are more people living on the planet today, almost, I don't think I'll miss it very far, there are almost as many people living on the planet today as have lived all the way back through human history. Now, we can't picture that. In fact, I was just reading something again the other night. Do you realize that most of the present-day world was totally unknown and uninhabited until about 1,000 to 1,200 A.D.? Think about that. The whole Western Hemisphere was pretty well uninhabited and unknown until after 1000 A.D. And the same way with much of the South Sea Islands and so forth. So you see, the world's population was relatively small. I think I read one time that at the time of Christ, the total population was only like 500 million. That's one half of one billion. That's a lot of people. But nothing compared to the seven plus that we are today. And so when God's wrath and judgment is poured out on this final generation, he is literally dealing with almost as many people as have lived down through the centuries. Now that should answer the question, then, why should this generation suffer so? Because they are symbolically representative of all that's gone before. All right, read on. Verse 17, another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out who had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him who had the sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather or bring together the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Now, naturally, in all of antiquity, and in fact, in many places of the world today, what was the staple drink? Well, the grape juice or the wine. And so here was the indication then that when they gathered the ripe, the ripe grapes, where did they go? Into the wine vat. They didn't go to the supermarket. They went into the wine vat. All right. So he says, verse 19, Gather the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Now again, this is symbolic language. What was a wine vat? Well, it was an enclosure. Not all that big. And at the bottom was the drain where they could crush the grapes. And So if we're dealing now symbolically with the human race, what will be God's wine vat into which he will put the masses? The valleys, especially of Israel the valley of Megiddo, the valley of Sharon, the Jericho Valley. See, little Israel is divided by all these separate valleys. They're going to be packed full of the armies of the world that are still left. 200 million coming from the Orient. And when I taught the Revelation series, you remember I, I made the illustration. This is under a supernatural set of circumstances. Those generals are going to do things that would ordinarily be considered absolutely stupid. Why pack all your troops into those valleys? They're going to do it. They're going to pack them in like sardines in the can. And you have no idea how many million men you can put in just a square mile. It's unbelievable when you read figures on it. And so millions are going to be packed into these valleys of Israel and waiting for then the treader of the grapes. And who will that be? The second coming of Christ. Now, I think he's going to use the physical elements. He isn't actually going to walk in them. That's a symbolic term. But you see, it's amazing that the last great plague that is listed in the book of Revelation is which one? Remember? The hundred pound <coughs> hailstones. That's the final plague. And now I do take the liberty here. The Bible doesn't explicitly say that. But I feel that once these armies of the world are packed into the valleys of Israel, 
then the hundred pound hailstones will be God's treader of the grapes. All right, read on. You'll get the picture. Verse 20. The wine press was trodden outside the city. In other words, we know that all these valleys in Israel are beyond Jerusalem. You got the Hula Valley up north of Galilee. And then you got the Valley of Megiddo just running off the north end of Galilee. And I've already mentioned the Valley of Sharon along the Mediterranean Sea. You got the Jordan Valley coming down from Galilee to the Dead Sea. All those valleys packed full of the army's troops or the world's troops. Oh, now look. And the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the wine press. Not grape juice, blood. So who are the grapes? Mankind. And the blood will run as deep as the horse's bridles for a space of 1,600 furlongs. That's about 180 miles. Well, if you know your geography, that's about the distance from the Hula Valley down to the Red Sea. And it's going to be a little literal river of blood mixed with water. Now let's see if I can find the verse that I want. The final plague, I think that's in chapter... Wow, I should have looked it up. See, I didn't intend to do this. That'd be in chapter 16. Yeah, chapter 16, verse 21. Chapter 16, verse 21. This is the final plague. Verse 21, and I don't think it takes a lot of imagination. The only thing that I'm showing that is really supernatural is how the armies of the world will pack into the valleys of Israel. That, of course, I'm using my, my own whatever. The Bible doesn't just say that, but it certainly is indicative. If God is putting his wrath upon a grape vat, then that means it has to be within an enclosure. And what better way to pick an, uh, picture an enclosure than a valley? And so that's where I get my thinking. All right, but now look at the final plague. And there fell upon men, not grapes, men, a great hail out of heaven. Every stone the weight of a talent. Now, if you've got a marginal help in your Bible, most of them say the same thing. How much was a talent? 100 pounds. 100 pound hailstones. Now, it's amazing that not too long ago, I read in our, I think it's in our daily Oklahoman, that there have been miraculous phenomena the last couple of years in various places around the earth where on a clear day, great chunks of ice will just simply fall out of the, ground, out of the air, up to 100 pounds in weight. So we're not stretching anything here. This is already happening in isolated places. All right, so 100-pound hailstones will fall upon these multitudes of men gathered now in the valleys of Israel. But does it change their thinking? Uh-uh. And men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, for it was exceedingly great. Well, now earlier in the tribulation, you have the same thing. Come back up with me to, uh, oh, let's see, chapter 9, Revelation chapter 9, and this again after listing some of the trumpet judgments, which will be shortly after, I think, the middle of the tribulation. But see, men don't change their attitude toward God. Revelation 9, dropping down to verse 21. Even after all the severe physical judgments that have come upon the planet, this is the result. Great revival? Uh-uh. Verse 21. Neither repented they of their murders, their sorceries. Now, I remember in my earlier lessons, I pointed out, what's the other word for sorceries? Pharmakia which means drugs, so it'll be a drug culture. They don't repent of their murders, nor their drugs, nor of their fornication, the gross immorality, nor of their thefts. Doesn't change them. Doesn't change their thinking. Doesn't change their lifestyle one iota. All right, but 
I think I've got time to show this, out of that will come a remnant who will become believers. Now come back with me to chapter 7. Chapter 7, and this is where I call the fulfillment of the Great Commission. The 144,000 young Jewish men. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, honey. Revelation 7, verse 9. So in the midst of all of this wrath and outpouring, God's 144,000 Jews are going to be proclaiming salvation. Now watch where it goes. Verse 9. After this, after the sealing of the 144,000, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, now watch where they come from, of all nations, see, that's why I call this the fulfilling of the Great Commission. They're going to come from all nations, <clears throat> and kindreds, and people, and tongues, but see, they've already been martyred. They're already pictured before the throne. They're no longer on the planet. And they're before the Lamb clothed with white robes. And then verse 10, And they've cried, Salvation to our God who sitteth upon the throne. So what's the picture? That as these 144,000 Jews circumvent the globe, preaching the gospel not of the grace of God, but the gospel of the kingdom, there are going to be multitudes saved, but they'll be martyred immediately. The powers that be will know who they are and they will be able to isolate them. But they'll only be a small percentage, as always. Now that may be a great number. You know, Tim LaHaye in one of his books claims that he feels the 144,000 will have more converts in those six and a half years than the church has had in 1900. Well, I'm not going to argue the point, but I think it's a stretch. But there's still going to be a lot of them. But compared to the whole... Just a small percentage. That's the way it's always been. And so they will be martyred just as fast as they profess their faith. But you see, they can't kill the 144,000 because they're sealed with the mark of God. But nevertheless, this is all just indicative of what the world is getting ready for. And the more you watch the news, the more you can see that it's coming. Because God's grace isn't going to last forever. His patience is going to run out. And if I haven't made any other point today, I hope I make this. Don't blame God. It's not his fault. It's because of their constant rejection of his glorious gospel of the grace of God. <coughs> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.